from the death of a monarch overseas to concerns over the endangerment of another type of monarch in the Hudson Valley, I'm talking about monarch butterflies specifically, we've had a heck of a week. Coming up on this episode of The Eagle, we'll go over the week's top headlines. It is yet another ongoing legal mess that the former governor will be involved in. We'll hear about surprising developments in the case of the limo company operator who put a doomed vehicle on the road in October of 2018 that killed 20 people in Schoharie. Dowman's attorneys are going to try to blame Navis Discount Tire and the state for this crash happening. And food critics Steve Barnes and Susie Davidson Powell talk about innovative and delicious things happening with desserts and drinks across the capital region. Out on the picnic table and there's this, you know, sort of garnet colored cocktail next to a rhubarb galette that was just terrific to look at. This is The Eagle, a Times Union podcast, a look inside our newsroom. I'm Jessica Marshall. If you're enjoying this podcast, take advantage of all the Times Union has to offer and support our efforts to bring in you award-winning journalism by becoming a Times Union member today. Go to timesunion.com slash subscribe. Welcome to The Eagle. I'm Jessica Marshall. First up, let's discuss what appeared in the Times Union and on timesunion.com this week. We are here once again, as we are every week we do this podcast, with Times Union Editor-in-Chief Casey Seiler. We're going to talk about what made headlines this week. We'll start with something that was kind of giving me flashbacks to last year around this time. Um, One of the women who accused uh, former Governor Andrew Cuomo of sexual harassment has now filed a lawsuit against him. So tell us what's happening there. Yeah, Charlotte Bennett, who was an aide in the governor's office and was, uh, if memory serves, the second woman to come forward with allegations of sexual harassment against the governor. Charlotte Bennett has um, filed a suit against the former governor and uh, several of his top aides, including Melissa DeRosa, who served as secretary to the governor, which is really sort of his top aide position, in addition to Jill DeRosiers, who was chief of staff, and Judith Mogul, who was special counsel. Bennett was the woman who said that Cuomo subjected her to wildly inappropriate remarks, questions about her sex life, the fact that she had been the victim of an alleged sexual assault previously. The governor, oddly enough, um, in response to many of these, did not dispute many of her allegations. He disputed some of them, but he said, oh, she's just misinterpreting what was my kind of patriarchal, father, fatherly, you know, you name it, efforts to, to give counsel to a young woman who seemed to be uh, in distress, that type of thing. Uh, Bennett rejects that and says that his um, behavior was I- extremely inappropriate, that these questions um, grossed her out forced her to go to these top aides to Cuomo. Um, In some cases, she was um, then shifted to another job where she did not have uh, meaningful responsibilities, continued to feel anxiety, to fear retaliation, and eventually left the executive chamber. She spoke to the New York Times at the end of February 2021. It was Bennett's um, uh, story when published in the New York Times that led to Cuomo really being forced to allow Attorney General Letitia James to call for or to organize um, uh, an investigation with two outside attorneys. Of course, we have also reported over the course of the past week the fact that Cuomo has filed an ethics complaint against the attorney general, as well as the two outside attorneys that she hired to conduct the investigation for their handling of, among other things, the investigation into Charlotte Bennett's complaints. So it is yet another ongoing legal mess that the former governor will be involved in. 
Stick by our Capital Confidential section on timesunion.com for more on that. Let's talk about another issue that is at the state level right now. Uh, Concerns over cases of polio that were discovered in the Hudson Valley this summer. Um, They have the state health department a little worried. What can you tell us about that and what do we all need to know? Yeah, the state is under a state of emergency for polio virus after these um, discoveries. Polio virus has turned up in, you know, uh, sewage surveillance, um, which is a new term that we're all familiar with after COVID. And uh, Rachel Silverstein, our outstanding healthcare reporter, called around to healthcare providers in the capital region to see if they have polio virus inoculations, the vaccine available, and they do not. This is, of course, uh, an inoculation that is standard at pediatricians' offices, but it's hard to get for adults. And of course, you know, the, the state of emergency has forced people to call up their parents to say, oh, hey, uh, are you sure that I did, in fact, get vaccinated uh, against polio? Uh, I'm happy to say that I was. I hope you were as well, Jess. I it, was, you yeah. Know, good. Um, is obviously a potentially uh, lethal and life-changing illness that everybody should be vaccinated against. So obviously, healthcare, the healthcare infrastructure is scaling up to make sure that everybody who needs it is going to get it, but we are apparently not quite there yet. All right, let's move on across the river to Rensselaer County, where this week the FBI arrested the Republican Board of Elections Commissioner on charges of electoral fraud. What's going on over there? Yeah, Jason Co- Schofield, who is the yeah the election commissioner in Rensselaer County, was arrested by um, the FBI on Tuesday morning as he left his residence. He has been charged with fraudulently obtaining and filing absentee ballots, basically using personal information to get a hold of absentee ballots that were filled out in the case of at least eight voters without their permission. That is according to an indictment that was unsealed just a couple of hours after Mr. Schofield's arrest. He entered a plea of, uh, of not guilty and um, he was released on his own recognizance. Now, this is just the latest development in state and federal investigations into potential electoral fraud in Rensselaer County, right? This is, of course, one of the, this is probably the most significant development. We have already seen a guilty plea from uh, now former um, Troy City Councilwoman, uh, and we are told that the investigation is ongoing. And while it is unclear if more uh, arrests are going to follow, they appear to be likely. What happens to Schofield now? He is, however, going to stay on the job. He is, of course, innocent until proven guilty. It is worth noting that the uh, Democratic election commissioner, Ed McDonough, was alleged to have taken part in a ballot fraud scheme many years ago in a case that, for reasons we won't get into here, went all the way up to the Supreme Court, but was ultimately uh, acquitted. So that's uh, something to bear in mind uh, as we come into a busy election season. In Rensselaer County, elections will, at least in part, be overseen by somebody who is under indictment for ballot fraud. Well, we will be watching that, no doubt. All right, let's talk about the Albany International Airport now, which is getting a sizable chunk of money toward a massive expansion. What What's going on over there? Yeah, a $60 million state grant will be um, paired with other monies for a $100 million terminal spiff up. If you have ever uh, gone through security at Albany International Airport, you are probably familiar with the experience of the line backing up across the pedestrian bridge that leads to the, uh, the covered parking garage. Basically, that area, you know, the sort of overflow area is going to expand. If you go on timesunion.com and look at the rendering, it looks like a snazzy glassed in expansion of the current terminal that will um, lend a lot more space to the security pass through there on the second floor. There's also going to be additional retail. It is, you know, the largest and most costly 
improvement project in all of the international airports uh, history. And of course, the uh, the non-flying foot traffic through the security <laughs> gates might lessen slightly now that there are Chick-fil-A's planned for the region. But uh, we talked about that last week. What I do want to talk about is one more thing related to food. Stewart's, one of Stewart's ice cream flavors, has been crowned essentially the best flavor ice cream in America. What flavor is that? Uh, that flavor is peanut butter pandemonium, which is a remarkable flavor. Stewart's was absolutely killing it in the uh, the ice cream competitions this year at the 55th annual World Dairy Expo, but uh, peanut butter pandemonium uh, came out on top, a remarkable finish by a champion. Absolutely. I actually have a carton of it in my freezer right now. It involves chocolate fudge, vanilla ice cream, and peanut butter cups, in addition to just giant globs of peanut butter. So uh, I highly recommend it. Anyway, thank you so much, Casey, and we will check back in with you next week. Thanks, Jess. As always, you can learn more about all of the topics and issues that we discuss on this podcast at timesunion.com. And you can follow Casey Seiler on Twitter at Casey Seiler. Let's move on now to talk about another story that made headlines this week. The criminal trial of prestige limo company operator Nauman Hussein is officially set for next spring. Hussein put the limousine on the road in October of 2018 that killed 20 people after catastrophic brake failure. Last year, Hussein pleaded guilty to 20 counts of criminally negligent homicide in a deal that would see him serve no jail time. Times Union reporter Larry Rulison was in the courtroom when a judge threw out the plea deal at the end of August. It was a stunning reversal of fortune for Nauman Hussein. Rulison was also in the courtroom this week when that same judge issued a trial date. I caught up with him to learn more. This case is scheduled for trial May 1, 2023. That essentially gives everyone six months or so to get this case ready for trial. All right. So I, I think maybe we should just start with, and back up a little bit because I didn't really get to talk to you last week about it, um, what the developments were originally. So there was kind of a, a shocker, right? Can you just tell us what happened? Right. Yeah. A big shocker indeed. Um, so a year ago, it was September 2nd. 2021, Naman Hussein, the owner of the uh, stretch limo involved in the Schaheri, 2018 Schaheri limo crash, agreed to a plea deal where he would plea guilty to 20 counts of criminally negligent homicide. The deal was a no jail plea deal. He would uh, serve five years of probation. Two were supposed to be interim probation and then three years of regular probation. But what happened was the uh, judge who did that deal, George Bartlett the third, who oversaw that deal between the DA, Scary County DA, and attorneys for now the same, retired since that initial plea deal. So a new judge was put in place till a new one could be elected this November, and that's uh, State Supreme Court Justice Peter Lynch. He was serving as like an interim judge. When he saw the plea deal, he said, I don't like this. It's totally flawed. I'm not signing off on it. I want you to go to trial, Nauman Hussein. So that was the big shocker. He Nauman Hussein went from basically someone who's going to serve four years of probation to facing trial now, and he could be potentially sent to prison for up to 15 years because the other charge he was originally charged with was uh, manslaughter. You know, kind of remembering back to a year ago when you talked about this on the podcast with Ben Ryder mm-hmm. Howe, like you just talked about this really kind of emotional reaction to the original plea deal, which had no prison time for Hussein. And then to have it flipped over, I mean, he's not been tried or sentenced yet, but to have a chance at that again, like how big was that for you as a reporter and the people that you talked to? It was amazing. I'll just say this. This is the only time I've seen Nauman Hussein show any emotion. And after he was told that he had to go to trial, 
he looked devastated. I, I, he was just deflated. You know, his girlfriend had to like hold his hand walking out of the courtroom. His brother had to console him all the times before I seen him. He was like, you know, resilient and uh, his face up. I mean, he's never talked in court, but you could tell this crushed him for the families. They were elated. They, they cheered in court. They've been wanting some sort of justice. They never agreed with the district attorney's decision to go along with this plea deal. And obviously, um, they wanted to see Naaman Hussein be held accountable if indeed, you know, he was guilty. So as a reporter, I've never seen anything like it. It was, um, I don't want to say a breath of fresh air, but this Judge Justice Peter Lynch He's just been unflinching and all about transparency and wanting to have justice take its course. So in a lot of ways, it was, as a reporter, just to see the wheels of justice move more swiftly and and more freely, it was amazing. Well, you mentioned moving swiftly. Uh, This week, there was an update to that story that may have uh, taken the wind out of the sails a little bit with regard to that particular aspect of it. So what happened this week? So when everyone was in court uh, last month, the judge uh, Lynch said that he wanted the trial to start December 5th, which to me sounded pretty quick. Then a couple days later, we heard that there was a change in plans and the lawyers for Hussein couldn't make December 5th because Lee Kinlan has a murder trial in Albany at the same time. So Peter Lynch said October 31st, which was, wow, right around the corner. Today we get in court expecting it to be October 31st. And what had happened in the interim was that the district attorney, Susan Mallory, said, I'm not ready for trial. I can't get this done. I can't bring now I'm going to trial by October 31st. So the judge today said that he will start the trial on May 1st, 2023, which, and he said that'll give everyone six months to get ready for this trial. It's very surprising though, because back in, I think it was 2020 at the, right after the pandemic hit before the trial had been delayed because of COVID-19, the Susan Mallory, and it might've been 2019, Susan Mallory said she was ready for trial. So it's very strange that now, even though it's been a while, she says she's not ready for trial, even though she had been before. So it's kind of like, yeah, I did my homework, but it's not really ready. So I need more time. So going forward. Okay. So the trial is going to begin in May. You know, what yes. do you think are the most important things to know um, about it? Well, the defense, Nauman's attorneys are going to try to blame Navis Discount Tire and the state for this crash happening because the uh, Hussein's attorneys are trying to going to try to prove that Mavis didn't fix the brakes on the limo, the crash limo, uh, when Hussein brought it to them saying, well, I'm, this failed an inspection. I, I want you to fix the brakes. They put an inspection sticker on the limo, which it's not the right kind of inspection sticker. It wasn't the right one. They didn't fix the brakes entirely. It's unclear if Hussein asked them to or not. Mm -hmm. or if he said, I'm going to, you know, he said he was going to sell it anyway. So, but the brakes were the cause of the crash. So, and then the other thing is that Hussein's lawyers are going to try to blame the state for not doing um, their jobs in sort of overseeing this whole process and that everyone else was to blame except their client. So that's going to be the big thing. And then otherwise it's going to be very interesting to see how Mallory tries to attack that defense. And so far, she hasn't really done a good job with that because she was the one that actually uncovered the fact that Mavis hadn't done some of the work that had billed Hussein for. She had to disclose it back in 2019 to the defense and the judge in the case to say, oops, we discovered these discrepancies in the case. And it's partially why she agreed to the plea deal in the first place. She didn't think she could win this case. So for her to now say, get ready for trial, it's going to be very interesting if she can. She has a very small office. There's a couple of vacancies, I believe, at least one with assistant DAs in their office. It's not an easy trial for her to prepare for. It's not the kind of trial she's normally used to doing. 
those will be the two major things, it, you know, because Hussein has two high profile, highly paid lawyers, Lee Killen from Albany, but then Joe Takapino from New York City, who's well known throughout the country and the world as a really good defense attorney in high profile criminal cases. So Susan Mallory, small town district attorney, she's, you know, very smart, very well respected, but her office is small. Can she compete against those high-priced attorneys for Hussein. You can follow Larry Rulison on Twitter at Larry Rulison. After the break, how does a s'mores pot de creme paired with a cachaça and Haitian orange Amaro cocktail sound? If that's up your alley, you will want to hear what else Steve Barnes and Susie Davidson Powell are going to recommend. Stay tuned. If you're enjoying this podcast, take advantage of all the Times Union has to offer and support our efforts to bring in you award-winning journalism by becoming a Times Union member today. Go to timesunion.com slash subscribe. Welcome back. You're listening to The Eagle, a Times Union podcast. I'm Jessica Marshall. Anyone up for some drinks and dessert? Times Union food critics Steve Barnes and Susie Davidson Powell put their heads together recently to highlight the Capital Region's top drinks and desserts in this year's Essential Restaurants Guide. The duo joins us now to talk about how this pairing plays out in a delicious and enticing way at bars and restaurants around the region. All right, Steve, so tell us, how have you shaken things up this year? The essential restaurants issue issue this year is called desserts and drinks. We're unofficially calling it uh, the vice issue. And we decided that rather than trying to come up with either a, a new list of 75 or having the same static list of 75 essential restaurants that we'd had uh, in past years, we would have a slightly different focus that would allow us to expand the scope. And so in addition to cocktails... Uh, we also, at restaurants, we also have desserts from restaurants and then desserts from bakeries and things. And Susie and I initially thought we might be able to only come up with 50, but then, in fact, it was a lot easier than we, we'd expected. Susie, when you were uh, going back through your notebooks and reviews that you'd done and the photos you'd taken, you found an unexpected abundance of desserts, particularly, didn't you? Absolutely. And I would have to say, you know, we don't always get a lot of space to write in detail about all of the cocktails and all of the desserts that get tried you know, during the dining reviews. Um, but there are really some very creative people out there, whether it's uh, the bartenders, mixologists, or um, bakers or home bakers, of course, after the pandemic who have their own businesses. Um, we really were able to swiftly pull together that list and probably could have gone on to 100 without much effort. <laughs> I think our initial list that you and I came up with was more than 90, which meant we were cutting 15 plus from the list to get it down to the 75. And we thought we'd have trouble getting past 50. Now, there are many places that are just in one category or the other, but I'd say there are at least 10, if maybe even 15, where there are both there in both categories. They there's a restaurant that has a cocktail and a uh, restaurant that also has a dessert. And one of those, uh, for instance, is a brand new place opened just this year called Restaurant 605 in Albany. And the chef uh, had brought in gooseberries. He, you know, they, he thought they were fun and interesting and he wanted to play with them, didn't know what he was going to do. And the bartender came in and said, gooseberries, make me a simple syrup. So she did a bourbon cocktail with gooseberry simple syrup. And he made, he took an herb focaccia and slathered gooseberry compote on the top and that was a great example of kitchen and bar working together. And I know you found that elsewhere. Hamilton Ghost uh, in Saratoga is, is famous for that sort of collaboration front and back of house. Absolutely. I think we're seeing more and more of that. That's been a sort of a trend over the years in terms of that collaboration between kitchen and bar. And, you know, sometimes it's an individual ingredient, like you're saying with the gooseberries. And sometimes, for example, um, curry pata, which is Alton Altamont, you know, they're always creating something and they were using, um, they made a creme brulee naan, 
which you wouldn't expect that to be a dessert. And that's definitely some kind of uh, unique creation on the dessert front. And then they were using tamarind, which obviously is popular in Indian and Pakistani cuisine in a bar drink. Um, they were making a mojito with it. So, I, you know, we do see that um, sort of symbiotic relationship and you definitely can't miss it at a place like Nighthawks, where depending on whatever is on their super short, tight menu, that's very often being used by the bartenders, especially uh, Amanda Baker. She's always doing something creative. They had a brown butter mushroom infused bourbon in the most unusual riff on an old fashioned, basically, that I've ever had. Very earthy, very unusual, but it just so happened they were using mushrooms. Um, you know, I think they only had a half dozen items on the menu that week, but that's what was being used then. And not just in its raw form, but also, you know, literally pan sautéed and using that butter, the fat washing technique, but with mushrooms sautéed and then infused into the bourbon. I mean, you can't make this up. One of the things as we were putting this together that I, that I think you and I both noticed is how beautiful some of these creations can be. There's a picture in, in this issue from the Berlin uh, in Troy that is absolutely gorgeous. And you took a photo from Quinney's in Hudson out, out on the picnic table. And there's this, you know, sort of garnet colored cocktail next to a rhubarb galette that was just terrific to look at. And that's one of the things that I really enjoyed seeing. And, and to page through this book, is extraordinary to see how lovely this stuff is. And I would think maybe restaurants should be putting these on their social media more often because you take one look at that and you're like, I'm going to have that rhubarb galette. There's beautiful things. I mean, those, those photos, whether they were mine, yours provided, you know, very often people say when you're describing something, they're like, oh, do you have a picture you can show me? And I do think that's what this particular, um, you know, essentials publication does. It literally gives people a show and tell, you know, hey, go to Quinny's. That cocktail you're talking about is the Hey Mama, that, um, you know, rhubarb galette. They might have something else by now. But um, it's really visually appealing. And I'm, I'm sure it's going to entice people to go and, and visit. Well, there's a, the ancient saying is, you know, you eat first with your eyes. And I, I amplified on that in a, in a column earlier this summer in which I, there's the caveat to that in that we add our eyes add context because it's hard to make chicken parm look beautiful. It's just, but we look at it, we're like, ah, I definitely want that. Uh, thinking uh, forward, looking for what other pairings do you think if desserts and drinks work magically? And if we wanted to do some other things and include additional businesses, what are there? What are there other ideas that we can that we might explore that you think could be celebrated in this way? Uh, in addition to just saying an essential restaurant is Gus's, an essential restaurant is Fifteen Church. Here's some desserts. Here's some drinks. What else is there out there in a more specialized way that that would be worth celebrating? Do you think? You know, we we have previously written a lot about you know farm stands and produce from farmers markets. And we see that relationship again with restaurants. Um, I mean, I guess this is rather seasonal, but it's very interesting to see the application of um, how restaurants take, you know, whatever is in season or what they got at the farmers market, or even some of these small sort of cottage industry producers, you know, there's a lot of bakers um, that the bread makes its way onto restaurant tables. And that might be an interesting pairing. I mean, I just wrote about a restaurant in uh, Stockbridge, Massachusetts, which is a little bit of a drive, but they literally had for dessert fresh peaches that were just from a local farm. They couldn't have been more perfect, more pristine. Uh, and then, of course, they had, you know, made a, a rather beautiful whipped cream with lemon and, you know, it was like a syllabub. But that relationship, you know, it might be something to to really highlight. I mean, it can be in lots of ways. I mean, you might have ice cream that you pour olive oil on, and we have a lot of local olive oil um, producers with sea salt, um, things like that, that just to sort of talk about where the things are coming from. The 75 Essential Desserts and Drinks was delivered to home subscribers on September 15th, but it is available online. You can order it at timesunion.com for just $4. We'll have it shipped to your house and you can page through it. Uh, leave it on your coffee table, put it in the glove compartment of the car, use it as a guide. Each entry includes the name of the place, hours, address, website, 
There's photos with everything. Use that to explore the desserts and drinks. And next year, we'll be back with another edition of 75 Essential Restaurants. You can follow Steve Barnes on Twitter at Table Hopping and Susie Davidson Powell at Susie DP. That's S U S I E D P. All right, that's it for this week. I'm Jessica Marshall, Jess underscore on underscore ice on Twitter. We'll be back next week with another look inside the newsroom here at the Times Union. In the meantime, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram, or head on over to timesunion.com for the latest news and features. The Eagle is a production of the Times Union. It's produced and edited by me, Jessica Marshall, with help from the Times Union digital team and the newsroom. Special thanks to Casey Seiler, Larry Rulison, Steve Barnes, and Susie Davidson-Powell this week for their contribution to this episode.